I'm senior portfolio strategist, Jim Haskell. Yesterday, we woke up to the positive news from Pfizer announcing the efficacy of their COVID-19 vaccine. To discuss that news and its significance and the broader state of the pandemic right now, I sat down with Richard Falkenrath, Bridgewater's chief administrative officer, and Kieran Rao, a senior manager and medical doctor who leads Bridgewater's COVID-19 task force. Richard is a former senior White House official who was at the center of the response to the SARS outbreak, and Kieran has previously done significant epidemiology work with the Gates Foundation and the World Health Organization. Richard, Kieran, welcome. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Richard, we got potentially promising news this morning on a COVID-19 vaccine, and markets have responded accordingly. Can you just take a moment to quickly summarize what the news, in fact, was? Absolutely, Jim. So Pfizer has been conducting stage three clinical trials of its vaccine candidate for COVID. What that means is they've enrolled 44,000 people into a randomized study where half of them get a vaccine candidate and the other half get a placebo. And this morning, they released a press release with some interim results from that trial. And in that, it's incredibly promising news. They found that the people that got the vaccine instead of the placebo were about nine times less likely to get the disease. And on a statistical basis, that's at the outer cone of our expectations of how well it could go based on the sort of data and the trials that they were collecting. Richard, you talked in, the, in our internal research meeting this morning about what we do know and then what we don't know about this vaccine. And I'd love if you could just relay some of those thoughts here. You sure, Jim. The, what we don't know is a lot still. Uh, and just to give four categories of information that will come out in, at later steps in the clinical trial. First, we don't know how safe the vaccine is yet. And so watch very carefully the next release that Pfizer puts out scheduled for the third week of November to talk about any adverse health side effects that the people in the trial may be experiencing. That will be very important. Second, we don't know about subgroup efficacy. So the data they released was about the total group, but we don't know, for instance, how the elderly or the immune compromised populations within that group are responding. Third, we don't know the duration of immunity once it's conferred. conferred. And finally, we're, we don't know yet if the protection conferred by the vaccine actually stops a person from being infectious, which is very important to getting the indirect protective benefit of a national or global vaccination program. Okay, so things still to come. Kieran, I want to turn to you and just just so everyone knows, Kieran, you've been an invaluable source to all of us at Bridgewater. So um, you, you made a point uh, this morning as well. This vaccine uses a new technology. And uh, I'd like, if you could, to explain what's different about it than the traditional vaccines and the significance of that difference. Thank you, Jim. Um, this vaccine uses uh, messenger RNA, which is a form of genetic material of the virus. And there are two implications from that. The first is these types of vaccines have never been approved for humans before. So it would be a, an incredible but surprising result if uh, we got the very first vaccine right in the middle of a huge pandemic, but that'd be very hopeful indeed. The second is because of the nature of the genetic material, it needs to be stored at very cold temperatures, minus 90 Fahrenheit and so on, which makes distribution that much more difficult. So we are carefully watching the ability of countries and local governments to distribute the vaccine uh, to arrive at the right level of um, penetration. Richard, it's important to remember that Pfizer's mRNA vaccine isn't the only vaccine in the works and that there are multiple potential vaccines in late stage trials right now. Can you give us a sense of where the broader vaccine initiative currently stands? Yes, as you said, there's four or five other vaccine candidates in advanced clinical trials in the United States. And that's really good because we've got multiple shots on goal. We're not sure exactly which one is gonna become the most effective and the safest and the easiest to produce on global scale and then distribute. The US government is buying almost all of it. That's for domestic production. And that also is important because it basically eliminates economics as a calculation for these pharmaceutical companies. And the US government will then buy it 
for the entire population and distribute it to the people through the states. Other countries are doing similar things. But that then leads to one of the big questions that the vac vaccination program raises, which is how many people are going to take the vaccine, even if it proves very effective and very safe, which are big ifs. And uptake, the amount, the, the number of people willing to actually go get this vaccination is something that will determine the overall efficacy of the vaccination program and how much indirect protection these, these vaccines will confer to the entire population. And we don't know yet how many people are gonna be willing to take the vaccine when it becomes available. Kieran, while we're waiting for a vaccine, there have also been various therapeutics we've heard about. Remdesivir, the Regeneron antibody viral drug used by President Trump, and overall, the fatality rate of COVID-19 seems to have fallen. Can you give us an update on how our ability to treat COVID-19 has evolved since the start of the pandemic? Yes, Jim. Overall, I'd say that doctors have been able to bring down the fatality rate by about 30% relative to the peak we saw in April, May. To put it in context, um, COVID was about 10 times as deadly as the flu. It's now down to maybe six to seven times as deadly. Now, there are two things that are driving this improvement. The first is what you mentioned, some of those drugs, but they're still having marginal, or benefic uh, marginal benefit right now. The bigger thing driving the reductions are that younger people are taking more risks and getting more of the infections. And thirdly, the fact that doctors have a lot of mind space when cases are low in the hospital. As we look ahead, we don't think that this is likely to persist as hospitals have the risk of getting overrun in, in a fall and winter resurgence. But mostly, I would say that till the middle of next year, um, we don't see any breakthrough new treatments that might change this. And we still should expect COVID to be about seven to eight times as deadly as the flu this season. Richard, one last question for you. This news is obviously very good and we're cautiously hopeful like you counsel. But at the same time, the state of COVID-19 right now in the US and in Europe has actually been getting much worse over the past month or so. Can you close by giving us an overview of what's going on right now in terms of the spread of the virus? Right now we've got a return to exponential growth in cases in many parts of Europe and in the center of the United States. And that is being driven by human behavior. There are no medical blocks to the spread of the disease. And the virus is basically unchanged from what it was when it started earlier in this year. And so what's happening is people have let down their guard and have begun socializing more. Uh, we're seeing relatively fewer super spreader events, more small group transmission, more transmission in sporting events and in homes. And as long as that continues, and the virus is in general community spread, it will, keep, it's, it will keep growing. And so until there is a vaccine or a herd immunity effect, which will not occur until 2021 at the earliest, the only way that these curves can be bent is by changes in human behavior, wearing, mask, wearing masks, maintaining distance, not going into crowded, especially indoor places. And while people are still doing that, with this much virus in circulation, you will continue to have growth. And so I think we're looking at, at a fairly long, dark winter with a lot of cases until we begin to get behavioral change, either spontaneously from the population or mandated by government. Richard, Kieran, thank you so much for your time on what was very quick notice. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim.